morning, church. Let us gather this morning, giving him praise, giving him glory, giving him thanks, remembering who he is. He's not just a God that we serve. He's also our Father, a Father who loves us. Lord, you are holy. We worship you, Lord, in your sanctuary. May our praise be acceptable unto you, Lord, because sometimes that's all we can bring, God. We bring our praise into your presence, Lord. Come and dwell in our midst.
You are not a distant God. Lord, I know you. You are right here with me, with us, with your nation, with your people, oh God. We can face any darkness. Through the storm with you, mm -hmm. there was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the sea. Should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. There's a grace when the heart is on the fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire. Standing next to me was another in the waters, holding back the sea. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burdens where another died for me. There is another in the fire. Oh. My dead left for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I will back to the things of this world. No.
is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed and I'm reading I'm not normally a King James kind of gal I love it I'm not saying I don't like it it's just normally not my go-to <clears throat> but I really like the translation the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So let's break that down for just a moment before we come into these altars. The effectual, so something that is effective, something that's successful, right? Something that is accomplishing much, right? Fervent, so something that is full of, of power, right? Something that is um, continuous, constant, cons um, there's another word, I've just lost it now. Um, but yes, ever increasing, fervent, like on fire, something passionate, right? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. Now let's stop there for just a second because the Bible says that no one is righteous, not even one. So then you kind of say to yourself, well, how can we even pray this prayer? You have to remember that as we come under the blood of Jesus, and declare him as Lord and Savior over our lives, his righteousness covers over us. When he sees us, he sees his righteousness over us, right? His blood has covered our sins. He has given forgiveness. He has extended grace and mercy to us. So going back, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man and I'm going to take my liberties here and say, or woman, so person, a righteous person, availeth much. It accomplishes much. So we pray by faith. We believe that the Lord not only hears us, but that he hears what we ask of him. We pray according to his will. We pray believing for what he will do. And so it says, confess your faults one to another Pray for one another. I'm not asking you to come up here and do confession this morning. <laughs> so you're not coming up to confess your faults. I pray that you have taken care of that already with the Lord directly right now for in this instance. But here's what I do want you to do. I want you to find somewhere comfortable, even if it's just a step away from your chair, or to come into these altars. And I want you to find a place that you're going to extend effectual, fervent 
prayer, okay? And you're going to do that whether you have a need of your own. You, uh, those of you that are watching and those in the room, I believe everybody, for the most part, is aware that Pastors Bobby and Lisa and Pastor Stephanie um, have tested positive for COVID, and so they're recovering. And so we want to pray effectual, fervent prayer for them, for Pastors Lisa and Stephanie's parents, Dwayne and Leona Skelton, as well as maybe others that are in your world uh, that you're aware of, or, and not just that, not just COVID, but praying for those who are in need regardless. If it's a physical touch that you need in your body, if it's a financial situation, if it's a, a family situation, effectual, fervent prayer. And like I said, if you've got your heart right with the Lord, if you haven't, let's do that right now. And let's make sure, Lord, forgive me of my sin, cleanse me of my unrighteousness, set my heart to be in alignment with your will and your purposes. Forgive me, Lord, that I may be in right standing with you, that your righteousness is covering over me as my Lord and Savior, that you see your righteousness over me. And now, now, let's find a place like I said, get step away from your seat. If you're comfortable, come up into these altars. But let's spend some time in effectual, fervent prayer. And as God's righteous people, we believe it is going to accomplish much. We're by faith trusting for God to hear us and to respond. He calls us to pray. He, he, he encourages us. He leads us and directs us to pray. So let's do just that.
looked at your account of that centurion coming to you, Jesus, and having just such humility before you to say, I'm not even, I'm not even worthy enough for you to come into to my home, but just say the word and, your, and my servant will be healed. And we're reminded that, Jesus, you were amazed at his great faith. This man who was not an Israelite, amazed at his faith and you told him, go. And you're going to have what you've asked for. And his servant was healed at that very moment. And so we continue to pray that for Pastor Bobby, Pastor Lisa, for Pastor Stephanie. And Lord, just say the word and your servants will be healed because you alone have the power. You alone, Lord, have the power to say, Get out of their bodies. In the name of Jesus, go. Yes, Lord. Speak to their bodies, Lord. Speak life to their lungs. Lord, Holy Spirit, envelop them with the breath of life. Envelop them, Lord, with your strength that they be renewed. Refresh today. Bring refreshing. Bring relief from symptoms, Lord. Recover, Lord, that their bodies recover under the authority of the name above every name that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We believe, we declare, and we trust, Lord God, for your healing. We thank you in advance before we even hear from them next. We thank you for a great report. We thank you, Lord God, for progress, for healing, for restoration. We thank you, Lord, that you have heard our prayer, our effectual, fervent prayer, and that you are saying, it has been done, been done according to your faith, what, has, what you have asked, what we have believed, and we thank you that you are healing at this very moment. You are healing. You are bringing help into their bodies. We glorify you. We praise you. Thank you, Lord God, for all that you're doing. You are an awesome God. You are worthy of praise and honor. You are our heavenly Father, and we thank you that we can have that intimate of a relationship with you. You're not a God that's afar off. Thank you, Lord, that you are with us. You go before us. Amen. 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 Welcome again. Welcome again, Hope Church. Why don't you take a few moments and greet one another. Our, all of our kiddos are going to be in our service today, um, but why don't you take a moment and just greet one another today. Well, as you're finding your way back this morning, a uh, couple of quick things. So we do have the uh, food pantry coming up on Saturday, on Saturday the 24th. And so if you haven't already and you'd like to participate,
fellowship here in town are um, collecting supplies that are going to be then distributed, put together as backpacks, and then given out to families that are in need in our area. So we do need volunteers for that. We do need some supplies. You can check the table for more information about what specific school supplies we're looking for. And yes, they are already out at the school at the store. I couldn't believe it. I went out there. I thought, surely they're not going to have school. Yep. Well, of course, Walmart, they have Christmas stuff out too. You know? <laughs> I'm kidding. They don't have, not yet. I'm not, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, right. <laughs> but um, so pick up a few of those items, if you don't mind. Help us to, to um, be able to bless kids in our community and get ready for school starting. And then if you are able, I'm just looking for one and one. So one volunteer to help represent Hope the day that all of the churches are, re are sending one volunteer to put the backpacks together and then one volunteer the week later to be a part of distributing them. Um, on, and they're both on Saturday dates. So if that's something you would be uh, willing to help with, just let me know and we can, I'll give you more details about that later. All right, and then also if you have your tithes and offerings, um, as typical, we have our baskets here and then we've got all kinds of ways to do it electronically. We have it in the lobby. Um, as well, and then there's an app. There's an app for that. There's always an app for that, isn't there? So, <laughs> but uh, but if you uh, if you've brought your tithes and offerings, feel free at any time to just kind of come up to the baskets or um, uh, or to to utilize our, our digital ways to give. And thank you for that. Thank you for your faithfulness. Speaking of, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you so much. I know that many um, in the room, those that are online, thank you so much for those who have um, been responding and helping um, with meals and just other, you know, is various and sundry a phrase? Am I using it right? Various and sundry. So just all kinds of ways that can be um, uh, available to help um, with different errands and things like that for, for those who have been down this week, so especially with Pastor and Lisa. So thank you so much for that. Um, it just sort of reinforces what, what and who we are as the body of Christ and being available one for another. So thank you for doing that. All right, so I'm sorry you get to hear me again this week. So <laughs> if, you, if, you have, if you have headphones, you may want to, or AirPods. I always want to call them something, AirBuds. I want to call them AirBuds, but that's like a dog movie. <laughs> if you have those things for yours, you could put them in. No, you better not. It's the word of God. Come on, whether it's me or not, right? Let's hear what the Lord has to say. Amen. So to be or not to be like David, we've been talking about David and his life, for the most part, really his pre-king life, because we haven't even gotten to the throne yet, guys. We're still talking about David before he becomes King David. Uh, but we're talking about the different characteristics, his qualities, the things that stand out that remind us or that point to these are some things that, that would be healthy in our lives to emulate. Um, not to be David and certainly not that he was Mr. Picture Perfect, but the things that he did that lined up with what it meant to be a man after God's own heart, which the Lord himself called him that. Uh, so that's, that's what we're looking at and for David, um, we have mostly focused up to this point, and it's, it's been because of where we've been in the scripture and following the sequence of his life, but mostly we've been talking about ways that we can be like David. Well, today we're talking about a way to not be. So today is the not to be, not to be like David. For those of you that are like, when are we ever going to get to the not to be? Today, today's the first day, and... Uh, don't celebrate because we do have a couple of other instances um, of ways that we can learn from David's mistakes. But God is so faithful. He's so faithful. And even when we're faithless, he is faithful. Even when we mess up and we fall, aren't you so grateful for a God who forgives and who hears and who doesn't turn his heart away from us when we have a sincere heart and, and repent? All right, so we're going to go into 1 Samuel. We're going to look at uh, a situation that happens in chapter 27, and we'll talk a little bit into 28, not very much. We'll just finish up there today. But let's go ahead and start with verse 1. Then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish, 
one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hands. Do you think, did anybody, like, when, when you hear this, do you think, surely this is not David. This is not the David that we've been talking about and, and reading about and studying all this time. Where is the David that said to his brothers, if y'all aren't going to get up and fight this guy for the glory of God, I'm going to do it. Where is the David that fought off a lion and a bear? Where's this guy? This guy says, now I shall perish by the hand of Saul. Better yet, if you heard last week's message, you heard of not one but two times where, God, where, where David had the opportunity to take Saul out. Like, get rid of him. Like, kill him. And he didn't do it. And yet, he was in the enemy's camp. He was surrounded by Saul's men. And yet, this guy came out of that, he and his 600 men came out of that unharmed victory. He chose to say, I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. And this is the same guy that is now despairing of life over the same man that he had two instances opportunities to, to kill? What's going on here? Well, for starters, it says that David said in his heart. That's kind of our first clue. And the reason why is because note that it doesn't say, then David talked to the Lord. It doesn't say, then David sought the Lord. Because we do see that a lot in David's life. It says, then David asked the Lord, should I go up? Should I go there? Should I attack the whatnots? And in this case, there is none of that. What do we see? It says, now David said in his heart. I don't have the scripture up for you, but, but as a reminder, although our, definitely our, um, I don't know if I say generation, but definitely we are in a culture that says, follow your heart. But the Bible doesn't say follow your, follow your heart. It says that the heart is deceitfully yeah. wicked. Don't follow your heart. Follow the Lord. Your heart will lie to you. Your emotions will not give you the right, clear picture of what's going on. And so the fact that it starts with, so David said in his heart, is why this is concerning. And then the words that follow only are filled with despair, discouragement, defeat, fear, right? He's saying, I'm going to go and flee. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run. I'm going to hide because I, I know that I'm, you know, how do you, how do you say that? A, a man full of faith, why does he say, I know I'm going to die at Saul's hand. I know Saul's going to kill me. He's tired. He's tired. David has grown weary of well-doing at this point. And we can't fault him too much. It's really easy, right? It's really easy on this side of biblical history to say, well, he should have known better because of wherever we stand now and because we know the end of the story and because of grace, because of the cross. We, we can say a lot of things by faith. But I think we can all probably admit to the fact that we've been there too. We have grown weary of well-doing a time or two or more in our lives. We too, if we're to be honest with ourselves, can remember instances where there was a great victory in our lives and within a day or two of that we're already under a juniper tree if you will sulking and saying i'm the only one god i don't know what else to do i can't keep this up anymore i don't, I don't know why as the people of god we have that tendency to forget so quickly the promises of god but we do yeah we're in we 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 are flesh uh, we need to walk by spirit, right? Not by the flesh. We need to walk by faith and not by sight. But unfortunately, circumstances arise. And in this case, David was weary. He was tired. 
The Bible doesn't specifically spell out, but you can tell by what he's saying that he was weary of running from Saul. And who wouldn't be? And, and though he doesn't address it, I think you can also, and I don't think this is a big leap in the scripture, to say that he, he was responsible for these 600 men who had, who had said, we're with you, man. We're, we're with you. Our hearts are with you. And here he had 600 men and their families that have committed to be on the run with him. That's a big stress as a person to know that you're leading these people through an, a, a situation that is unfair already to you, and now that's being carried over to them as well. So he was tired. He was drained. And then you got to think emotionally. Again, this is the guy who was formerly his uh, father-in-law. He, this guy, the same guy is his best friend's dad, Jonathan, his best friend's dad. This guy is the one and only at this time king of his people. And this is the same guy who's chasing him for no good reason other than that God has also anointed David and said, you're going to become king. And P.S. Saul, you messed up. And so you don't get to have this lineage anymore. So that's a lot of emotional baggage that David is carrying on behalf of himself, on behalf of God's plan that he has yet to see fulfilled, and on behalf of the people that are under his authority that he is, that he is leading. So yeah, we can understand. We can relate and say we understand what it's like to grow weary of well-doing and to get in a place like this. So for David, unfortunately, what we're seeing here is that he is opting, instead of going to the Lord while he's tired, while he's emotional, while he's discouraged and in despair, instead of going to the Lord, he is choosing to, to make some decisions for himself. And that right there is one thing that we don't, need to do. That is usually the time where we should and often tell other people, like, if you're down or you're frustrated or you're, what is it this you say, Pastor Mike, like broken, disgusted, and can't be trusted or something like that. I, I'm, I don't think I'm quoting it right. <laughs> I don't know about the can't be trusted part. <laughs> but, but, you know, we usually say if you're in that state, I mean, you've got to go to God. He is the only one that can help you. But a lot of times there's enough of, there's enough of the Lord in us that we know that because we're tired and, and drained, we may not want to hear what the Lord has to say because it may be hard or it may take some courage or it may take some, some faith that we don't want to muster up. And so oftentimes that's the last person we want to go to in making decisions and then Making decisions while we're emotional and tired and weary of well-doing without the counsel of God sets us up for failure. Pastors, I've, I know I've heard Pastor Bobby say it before, you know, high emotion, low wisdom. Okay? You don't, you don't need to be making big decisions when you're, you know, your emotions are high. Now look, I did not set my thing right here. Hold on just a second. I may need Ferris to come up here and be my tech support. <laughs> All right, that's what I get for getting off of my notes so much, right? Okay, and talk about not sounding like David. There's nothing better than to escape to Philistine territory. What? You're going where? To Goliath land? Why? What? Where? Who? What are you thinking? What kind of downtrodden state must David had been, had been in to choose to find refuge in enemy territory? Not anywhere else. He doesn't flee somewhere else. He goes to the, to the Philistines. But again, it's not, it's not all that hard to think of or not so hard to, to picture, especially when you remember that Saul, King Saul, had a terrible track record with the Philistines. Super bad. Again, might I remind you of Goliath, right? So he had such a bad track record with the Philistines that, okay, you could argue that maybe David was making some a little bit of rational thought here to say, okay, if I go into Philistine territory, he'll leave me alone because he knows he can't defeat them. He hasn't done it very well, so maybe he'll back off. Okay, 
I'll give David that, that, that I understand that line of thinking, but the ends don't justify the means, right? He's still sinning. He's still disobeying God. He's still going to the enemy for help, and that is not the right decision for him. Um, okay, so now let's go into verse 2. So David arose and went over, he and his 600 men who were with him, to Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. And David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, and David with his two wives, and Ahinoam of Jezreel, and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him. Then in one of the then David said to Achish, if I have found favor in your eyes, is he, why is he talking to Achish like this? This, oh, okay, anyway. Let a place be given me in one of the country towns that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So that day Achish gave him Ziklag. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. And the number of the days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. This was not a weekend trip. A year and four months. So good news, bad news, right? Good news, it does say Saul finally stopped pursuing David. No surprise, because like I said, he didn't have a good track record with the Philistines, so he probably got word of that and went, up. Oh, hmm. Oh, never mind. I'll leave him alone. Maybe he thought the Philistines will take care of my problem for me. I don't know. But bad news that, yes, while David was no longer being hunted by Saul, it took David doing something wrong to bring that about. And, and I get it. I get that being chased by Saul was exhausting, and I get the fact that, you know, you're responsible for these 600 men, and so you're trying to do something to give them some stability instead of being, you know, on the run the whole time. But again, 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 remembering the most recent um, victory in their lives that not once but twice that David had this opportunity to kill the Lord's anointed and didn't. And not only is that important because we see the kind of uh, man of honor that David is, but also, and I sort of alluded to this at the beginning, this is also a story of God's sovereign hand over David and his men. 3,000 versus 600. The odds are 5 to 1, not good, not in favor of David and his men. And not only are they in close enough proximity, they're literally, you know, a spear, a water jug, a cloth, a, clo a cut cloth throw away from Saul and his men, even to the point in the second instance that we talked about last week that David says, come send one of your men over here to come get your spear. So if Saul and his 3,000 men had been on the hunt for David and his men for so long and they didn't seize them right then and there, they had the opportunity to. Any and all of them could have, whether, whether Saul was down for it or not, any or, any or all of them could have at that moment said, we got them, you know, but they didn't. Why? The sovereign hand of God was upon them. Why did David not remember those moments that were fresh on his mind and to realize, if God protected me when I was literally standing next to Saul, why wouldn't he protect me now? But that is where, where he is. And like I said earlier, how quickly we forget God's victories in our lives, especially when we're in the middle of the storm. So David's discouraged. He's full of despair. He retreats with his family, his men, their families, to the enemy, ter enemy territory. He, in a manner of speaking, hitches his wagon with the enemy, um, King Achish, and settles down for almost a year and a half in this area, right? One commentary I read said, they lived in a fortified city, a formal place of defense, but apart from God, they aren't safer in the city. Let's move on to verse 8. Now David and his men went up and made raids against the Gesherites, the, Giz the Gerzites, I think I said that right, and the Amalekites. For these were the inhabitants of the land from of old and as far as sure to the land of Egypt. 
And David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the garments, and come back to Achish. So David began to raid communities that, to be honest, were people that God had told the Israelites to destroy. When they were coming into the land to take possession of it, God gave some instruction to Moses, and then eventually it was, it was accomplished through, um, through Joshua to come in to possess the land. And in, these were some of these people groups that, that David was going and raiding and looting were some of the, the carryover people that, that remained in the land. Okay? So I guess you could almost say, oh, well, he's just sort of uh, finishing up God's work. You know, he's just wrapping up whatever finished or what, whatever hadn't been done by the people before in this area. But no, and I'm going to tell you why uh, in a second. But I want you to pay attention. There was another group that was listed in this, in this laundry list, and it was the Amalekites. And this is actually a, a pretty significant group of people because they were really on God's naughty list. <laughs> the Amalekites, when, when Moses led the people out of Egypt, and as they were going to the Promised Land, the Amalekites um, basically like, took advantage of the weary and the weak that were in the, in, in the procession or in the caravan, and they were, they were brutal. Um, and they killed and, and took off some of the people of Israel. And so God, this is totally not politically correct for this day and age, but God said to the Israelites, you need to wipe them out completely. Like, not even any animals. Get rid of them because they showed such disdain for the, for the name of the Lord and for the glory of God. And by harming my people, um, so they, they've got to be ejected from this area. And so to some degree that happened a little bit with Joshua and the campaigns for the promised land, but not entirely. So now remember that Saul lost the kingdom. God said, you no longer get it because you sinned against me. Do you know, do you remember how he sinned against God? It had to do with none other than the Amalekites, these same people that God said, take them out, not to dinner. Take them out. <laughs> out. Out. Okay? I'm, I, I am, anyway, take them out. And Saul's like, well, I'm just going to leave the king alive, and I'm going to take some of his good stuff, too. And God's like, you know, obeying me a little bit is still disobeying me. Because that's not what I told you to do. So I'm going to take the kingdom from you. I'm ripping it from you, and I'm giving it to another. And this is where David comes into the mix of becoming the next king. So these Amalekites are just trouble, all kinds of trouble in the word of God. And here they are, some of the people that David is going out and raiding. So again, you could say, oh, well, see, see, David's doing what Saul was not strong enough to do. But remember what we saw, that it said that he was raiding these areas and that he wasn't leaving any man or woman alive. Okay, brutal, yes, and I know that's, that's a hard truth. We don't, you know, uh, we don't like to hear that, but we have to remember this is the whole word of God. Um, this is a, a circumstance long before our time that's going on here um, and long before the cross. But not only that, but it said that David would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the garments. So he's not doing this for the glory of God. He's doing this for himself. He is taking animals and garments because now they're looking for employment in this enemy territory, and they've got to find a way to, you know, to, to care for themselves and his 600 men. So he's become a mercenary. Nowhere does it say that God had told him, go and do this. Nowhere does, and, and when God normally did say those kind of things, they were followed up with like nothing. You leave, you leave it, or you, you take it all out. You're not taking any of it for yourself. And so the fact that David is saving up animals and garments for himself shows that he's doing this for profit. So this same guy that's a man after God's own heart has now opted to not consult the Lord, 
has opted to live in fear instead of faith and walking by sight and not by faith and has opted to go into enemy territory, not only in enemy territory, but is now like full on moved in for a while, not some short little stay, and he's going and attacking people for personal profit. And I'm sure that some, a little bit of that might have given him some comfort, like, oh, but these are the, the bad guys, you know, so I am doing God's work. Who knows, I don't know. But again, he's not, in, he's not in a place where he's listening to the Lord. We don't hear, we don't see any scriptures here in this account where he's talking to God. The Bible says that when he was in Philistine, ter or not the Bible says, but a commentary I read said that n none of the um, psalms that we have that he wrote were written when he was in Philistine territory. No surprise, because he was, he was pulling himself away from the Lord. God wasn't, God wasn't um, rejecting him. But he was pulling away from God, and he was making decisions based on hurt, based on emotion, based on fear, based on weariness, wow. not based on the trust that he knew to have in the Lord, the patience that he knew to have before God, who had taken him and led him up to this point and preserved him. So, basically now he's a mercenary. And he's just making bad decisions that are snowballing into other bad decisions. And here's the next one. When Achish asked, where have you made a raid today? David would say, oh, against the Negev of Judah or against the Negev of the Jer 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 Jeramelites or against the Negev of the Kenites. And David would leave neither man nor woman alive, which we knew that already, but listen to this, to bring, he would leave neither man or woman alive to bring news to Gath, thinking lest they should tell about us and say. So David has done. Such was his custom all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines. And Achish trusted David, thinking he has made himself an utter stench to his people Israel. Therefore, he shall always be my servant. Ooh, okay, so from bad to worse here. What, you, what, what we see here, the responses that he's giving Achish about the Negev of Judah or the Jeremiahites or the, the Kenites, so geographically speaking, he's telling a half-truth, okay? He's saying, oh, I was raiding down there, and yes, down there-ish area were the, Jew, the, the, the tribe of Judah and the Jeremiahites and the Kenites. And these were either people that were Israelites or that were friendly, you know, like uh, that, that had a good relationship with the nation of Israel, right? So nice neighbors down here. Um, so by saying that he was down in this area implied that he was raiding his own people. Okay, but really in this area were the Amalekites and uh, the others that he was actually raiding, the people that were former uh, and current, I guess you could say, but of old. Remember how it said something about um, the people of old that were in those areas? So these were some of those same people that the Israelites were supposed to wipe out that remained, and then definitely those naughty list Amalekites. And so... Here David is telling the king, oh, I was, uh, I was out, you know, raiding in this area. And he knew what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was doing because it says he said it that way on purpose so that King Achish would read into it that he was killing off fellow Israelites. And he knew that that would make King Achish enamored with him because then he's like, oh, ho, ho, ho. This is the David that they talk about, the, oh, Saul killed his thousands, but David killed his tens of thousands. This is the mighty warrior of Israel, and now he's on my side. I got him in my pocket. Yeah. He is now my warrior to use against his own people. Wow. Wow. So David knew that what he was saying was misleading and was deceptive, and that, too, 
is not a quality of a man after God's own heart. It is, however, a quality of somebody who's trying to save their own skin <laughs> and cover their place. <laughs> um, so again, David is just bad, 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 bad decisions made apart from the counsel of God, made as a result of maybe what started in fear then also became like, I just got to, I, I just got to protect, you know, what is it? I got to look out for number one, um, you know, so whatever he's got to do to like, so, for self-preservation. And now he's, here he is lying, lying to uh, his new buddy, the, the um, king of Gath, Achish. So, to add insult to injury, oh, I forgot this part. So, it's, it's always funny to preach the word of God because on one hand, you feel like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this little moment in time. But generally, you anticipate that, a lot of, that, that most, if not all, the people in the room know well beyond this story and into next stories, right? Even though we're not there yet. So it's funny because it's like, oh, but wait till you see. And, and it's like, well, no, I, I know. I know what happens next. I read my Bible. Um, but could it be that this instance with Achish and lying to him, deceiving him like this for his own personal gain, could it be that this was the seed, like the birthplace of this concept for David to be deceptive to get what he wanted? Because a few chapters later into 2 Samuel, we are going to read about another account where David, where we don't want to be like David, and that is when he decided to take out, but on a date, uh, not death. Well, actually, no, Uriah, he did take out. So he decides to take out Uriah, uh, and then he decides to do all of that so that he can, or no, beforehand, sorry. See, this is what I get for not reviewing this part. Um, but yeah, so we see the seed planted of deception that David then does in the future with Uriah and Uriah's wife at the time, Bathsheba. So we already see that there's some, there's some steps that David is taking that are unhealthy, ungodly, and that are setting him, himself up for failure, moral failure in this case too. But to add insult to injury to this instance right now, Let's just look at chapters 1 and 2 into the next, um, I mean, verses 1 and 2 in the next chapter, and then we'll conclude this scripture reading. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces for war to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, understand that you and your men are to go out with me in the army. I got, I got you. <laughs> David said to Achish, I will never go against my people. Oh, wait, no, that's not what it says. Very well. You shall know what your servant can do. Okay, yeah, there are some commentaries that say maybe he was being sly. Because he doesn't say, he just says, you'll see what your servant can do. Well, that could go either way, right? It could, maybe. We don't know what David's thinking in this moment, but... It says, and Achish said to David, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. It's kind of like the tables have turned, sort of. David is now poised to be the Philistines' next Goliath. Wow. What has happened in David's life to bring him to this point? How weary must he have been to even entertain this possibility? And more, more so because he knows the Lord. He knows the voice of the Lord. He knows the love of the Lord. He knows how to trust in the Lord and how to spend time with him and to hear him. So the fact that he was in this point of betrayal, not just against his people, but way more important than that, his betrayal against his God. What is up? with that. But we're not going to get into what happens next. That part, I trust that you're going to go and finish reading chapter 28 and some crazy situation that goes on there with, with King Saul, and then go into chapter 29 to see what the end of the story is for David in this, in this situation. So we conclude this scripture reading 
and just, wow, just to be at that place. So what can we learn? What can we learn from David here? Well, even with a really sincere heart and a passion for God and a love of his word and time spent with him, we are not immune to falling. And that is actually more of a stern warning for us because it reminds us that the enemy is ever-present and he does seek to take us out and not on a date or dinner or roller skating or whatever. But he is intent to steal, kill, and destroy us. Very much so because if we fall, If we are broken, if we make poor choices, he also knows that because we are representatives of the Most High God, then that will cause others to see our failure, and that may discourage them from walking with the Lord. Now, thankfully, again, we know the end of the story, and we know that David uh, returns to the Lord, and we see there's going to be a lot more in in the subsequent chapters and then becoming king and so on and so on. And we do see a man that really was sincere and and recognized when he did sin and knew to go to the Lord because against God alone is who he sinned against. And he knew that it was the Lord who would need to bring healing and recovery. And so we're so grateful for a God who is faithful when we are faithless. But we do need to be vigilant because our enemy is out there and because he does want to take us out. And so no matter where we stand, we have to remember that when we're weary, when we're discouraged, when we're depressed, when we're um, overwhelmed, when we're tired, we make bad decisions. Especially if we do that and we don't seek the counsel of God. And oftentimes, If we seek the counsel of God, but we choose to disobey him, we also make very bad decisions. And so, as we saw with David, we don't want to operate in that. Instead of going and and saying in our own hearts what we're going to do, in those instances, that's where we've got to turn. We've got to turn to the Lord. We've got to turn to the author and perfecter of our faith and to seek him and to seek his counsel. 2 Timothy 2.13 reminds us, and we already kind of said this, if we are faithless, he he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. There's something silly that we do in our house with um, with one of our cats named Fur. (laughs) And I want to, I know you're going to be like, why is she sharing? This is so dumb. But, um, so Ferb, he is an adorable cat, but he is a very stressed out cat. He can like, you you can pick him up and he'll just, he just shakes like a chihuahua, you know? Like, I've never seen a cat that can be so stressed out like this. Um, And even to the point where when we took him to the vet um, the first time, they had to put him in a a little cooling station with, I guess, the AC blowing on him because they said that he got so stressed out about being at the vet that his temperature spiked. And they were trying to get him to, like, chill, literally chill out. Um, and then they told me when I picked him up, they're like, so the next time you bring him, we have this um, prescription that we want you to get filled and make sure you give him some of this medication before you bring him again. <laughs> so I have to have my cat drugged to go to the vet because he's so freaked out. <laughs> On top of that, he can be really mean and spiteful especially to Ferris. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but Fer- oh, he just does not like Ferris. And I, we think that it has to do with he's jealous because he's, he's basically my little baby cat. And so I think he knows that Ferris is my son and he's like, he's competition. You know, I think so. He hisses at him for no good reason. He's hateful. He's just hateful to him. Um, so so for Ferb, we joke about like he needs some, some motivational posters. He doesn't have a room. I mean, we don't have a room just for the cat. Uh, But he has, like, this one wall that he likes to hang out by. And so we're like, oh, Ferb, we need to print some little motivational posters for you on your wall to just, you know, little little phrases to to encourage you. And so one of the phrases that we have that we tell him, you can show the first one, Ferris. And we say, don't be stressed, be blessed. Come on, Ferb, don't be stressed, be blessed. 
And then we also say, don't get mad, get glad. OK, that one is from a trash bag, isn't it, right? Isn't that like from the 80s or something, right? Don't get mad, get glad. Don't get mad, get glad. And then my personal favorite is don't be a pill, be chill. And so, he's, he's not vomiting. He's meowing or something there, but it looks bad. But we do, we try to tell him, we're like, don't be stressed, be blessed. Don't get mad, get glad. Don't be a pill, be chill. And maybe we should print those posters because maybe they would be happy or they would, maybe they would help me because sometimes I see those and it does remind me oddly enough of the promises of God. Like it reminds me to have my attitude and my attention in the right place and to not allow the present circumstances or the present weariness or the uh, you know, initial things that may cause us to fear or to walk in fear or to walk in the flesh, but instead to walk in the spirit and to walk by faith. And so to remember that God is still on the throne. He's still good. He is still at work. He's not done with us yet. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or imagine. And so whether we are tired or have grown weary of well-doing, that we remember that we don't have to stay in that state and we certainly don't need to make any, you know, major decisions like moving to the enemy camp when we're in that state, but instead that we keep our eyes fixed on the Lord. A couple of quick verses and then we're done. As I already quoted in uh, Galatians 6, 9, and let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall we reap if we do not grow weary. 2 Thessalonians 3, 13, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good or do not grow weary of well-doing. And then Hebrews 12, 3, for consider him, this is talking about Jesus, who endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Amen. So we don't grow weary. And while we often will look at David's life for encouragement and for a little bit of perspective, we still look at his life for perspective today but we look at an area that we can learn from to not be like David, to not grow weary in well-doing. And when we do find that we're growing weary, we need to seek the counsel of God. We need to go to the Lord for his strength and for his direction and then be willing to be obedient when we hear him as he speaks to us and not be afraid or not be discouraged or dismayed or distressed or depressed or broken or disgusted or something anyway but to not be stressed but to be blessed we are blessed God is still faithful he's still on the throne he's so good he's so good let's pray Father thank you so much that you're with us your word reminds us that you never leave us nor forsake us your presence was with David he didn't seek your counsel but it didn't mean that you wrote him off he was weary of well-doing and we can relate to that we're we're not sitting high on some pedestal here saying shame on you david can't imagine we too we can recognize that we've been there maybe we're there today but lord we are reminded that even when we're faithless, you are faithful. And I'm so grateful that we can come back to the throne of grace. I'm so grateful, Lord, that you hear us. There is a little bit of fast forwarding in the story that, that I'll say here, Lord, that we know that there's a situation that happens towards the tail end of 1 Samuel where he finally gets to a point that he reaches out to you and he says, should I go? Should I go and do this, Lord? And you speak to him and you tell him what to do. And not long after that, Saul dies and begins this two-part stage of, of David taking the throne that you anointed him for. You are faithful. God, help us to not grow weary in well-doing 
And when we are there, oh, Lord, help us to turn our eyes to you, to fix our eyes on you, not on our problems, not trying to resolve things in our own strength, because that will get us into trouble. That will lead us into the enemy's camp. When we're weary, when we're tired, even not a physical weariness, but Lord, I think about marriages. When we're weary in our marriages, what do people do? They stray. They look for solutions outside of their marriage, in other people, in other things. They've gone to the enemy's camp in that way. God, that's, that's not what you desire for us. You desire for us to look to you. You'll give us the instruction. You'll give us the wisdom, the counsel. You'll give us the peace. You'll give us the renewal, the refreshing that's necessary to keep moving forward. And so today, Lord, I pray that as we learn from David, balancing in our hands that measure of he's human like us, but yes, he made mistakes, but he turns to you. Help us to turn to you. Help us, Lord God, to hear your voice so clearly. Help us to not be afraid to seek your counsel or your will and be willing, Lord, to do what you say. And we know that you'll refresh and renew and restore us. Help us, Lord God, to not justify actions that kind of look like they might be godly or kind of look like they might be beneficial for ourselves or for others if we know that they are outright lies or they are outright deceptions. We don't want to walk out of step with you, Lord. What is it that Peter said? Jesus, when you talk to your disciples and so many of them, they couldn't, they couldn't stomach or they couldn't just process what you were asking of them. I think it was when you were talking about like your body is real food and your blood is real drink. And so many were like, oh, I'm out of here. But Lord, when you said to your disciples, you said to, you know, to Peter, like, and you, are you, what are, you know, are you, you going to stay or what are you going to do? And I'm paraphrasing here, Lord. But Peter said, where else can we go? You have the very words of life. You do. Where, where else but to you should we go? Not seeking our hearts, but to go to you. You have the very words of life, and we thank you. We thank you, Lord God, that you give life, that you direct our steps. Help us as we trust in you this week, and as we find ourselves, if we find ourselves weary, of well-doing, Lord, that we turn to you, that we not be stressed but be blessed, that we not get mad but get glad. And, well, I guess for some of us to not be a pill but to be chill. We give you all the praise and honor. Thank you for what you're continuing to do in and through those that are unable to be with us today. We speak blessing and healing and peace and wisdom over the Nixon and the Sweat and the Skelton Homes and others. We thank you, Lord God, for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. All right, well, uh, you're the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. As you go, glorify God. Amen, amen. intentions all my obsessions I want to 